Welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast by Scott L. Wyatt, President of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript for today's podcast. Hi again, everyone, and welcome to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. I'm your host, Steve Meredith, and joining me, as he always does, is President Wyatt. How are you, Scott? Terrific, thanks, Steve. So our listeners know that we very often record in a uh, small bedroom at the Center for Music Technology at Southern Utah University, and uh, small n- former bedroom. Uh, false, yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> We're not uh, working around the nightstands or anything. Yeah, <laughs> a former bedroom. But um, uh, they also know that I think that we pre-record these because the hardest thing about doing a weekly podcast is getting it scheduled. And it's particularly true uh, around a schedule as complicated as yours is. So. We are actually not in our former bedroom in Cedar City, but we are at the Big Sky Conference basketball tournament in Boise, Idaho, as we're doing this, um, and uh, set up in portable digs in a hotel room. So so I don't know if I've painted a a nice audio picture for our listeners, but anyway, here we are. Here we are with a little portable setup in a hotel room in Boise. Um, But... uh, one of the things that we've been talking about during this particular set of podcasts, this last 10 or 12 or so, has been innovative practices that we really admire and are interested in learning more about. And uh, and again, today, we are going to be talking to a very interesting and innovative educator. And uh, why don't you go ahead and introduce him? Thank you, Steve. Yeah, we've got Dr. Rob Thomas, who's a professor of geology at the University of Montana Western, joining us today from Dillon, Montana. Welcome, Rob. Thank you, Scott. It is nice of you to uh, give us some time, and and uh, you're probably just as happy that you're in Dillon instead of sitting in this little cramped uh, hotel room with us. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm just uh, enjoying the snow. <laughs> One of those years keeps coming down. Well, what's um, you have a very interesting story to tell about the University of Montana Western um, that was in kind of a crisis time, and out of crisis, usually um, we, we either die or something spectacular is born. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so let's let's go back. Um, and um, let's start with the founding of the University of Montana Western really briefly, and then yeah. then let's insert you into the equation. Okay. So, um, Univers- so the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think 1893, right? Yes, that's correct. Started as what? So uh, it was founded as Montana State Normal School in 1893. Uh, there were four campuses um, chartered uh, by the state uh, in Montana, uh, which became a state in the late 1880s, and then uh, uh, very quickly established uh, agricultural land grant institution in Bozeman, now Montana State University, uh, University of Missoula, University of Montana at Missoula, um, a school of mines, um, which is now yep. Montana Tech in Butte, and a normal school. And uh, there were three communities in Montana vying for the normal school, uh, Deer Lodge, Twin Bridges, and uh, Dillon. And Deer Lodge got the prison. Uh, Twin Bridges <laughs> <laughs> Twin Bridges got the uh, orphanage, and Dillon got the normal school. So that's... Um, it's so fun to hear some of the comparables in history because uh, Southern Utah founded almost the same time as a normal school, a uh, branch of the University of Utah, um, and in a small rural setting. But the, the difference is, is that you continued to be a normal school for a very long time. 
Yes. Yeah. Um, when Sputnik went up, most normal schools went down and uh, they became full service universities and uh, with science and engineering programs. Uh, my undergraduate alma mater, Humboldt State University, for example, was a normal school in Northern California. And uh, uh, but this campus uh, maybe is a function of its isolation. Uh, lack of resources in the state of Montana. I'm not certain the reasoning. Uh, maybe just hidden down here in the corner of the state. It, it never transitioned out of being a normal school. So when I arrived in 93, uh, we literally had elementary, secondary ed, and early childhood education. Um, that was it. Those were the and three majors. Those were the three majors. And uh, there were... Um, there was a bachelor's of liberal studies degree that had no titles to it, just BLS, um, which was a fallback degree for students who decided that, you know, if I had to teach fifth graders all of my life, I would probably kill one. Um, so I, I'm going to not do that. I'm going to get a different degree. Uh, they, they could fall back to this BLS degree. But um, to my knowledge, nobody had ever used it. But it was on the books. So you, and, you, um, you had been where just prior? So I had done my PhD at the University of Washington and uh, uh, worked with the only female in a department of 55 males and uh, Jody Bourgeois, <laughs> she was my advisor. And uh, I, my first job was at Vassar College in Poughkeepsie, New York. And I, uh, I was a tenure line faculty member in geology and geography there. And uh, long story short, I got bit by a Lyme tick and I had Lyme's disease and uh, was pretty sick. They were having a hard time figuring out what it was because it was early on in the whole Lyme disease crisis that was going on. But Dutchess County, New York is right next to Lyme County, Connecticut. So uh, I was in ground zero there <laughs> wow. um, for the problem. And uh, I, I loved uh, the, cam the Vassar campus and um, the, uh, uh, the student body I was working with and all, but I, I was inherently, I was a Westerner and, uh, you know, I wanted to be able to go out with my students into the mountains and throw a sleeping bag down on the ground and do geology. And uh, that was, it was road cut geology with students who didn't own sleeping bags uh back there so looking at it long term uh it was like i best get out of here before i can so uh this job came up at western uh they advertised for a person to teach earth science physical science and uh, geography and uh because of the old normal school uh, they were just hiring for classes that needed to be taught for the elementary and secondary ed majors so when I arrived, I came into an environment where it was the first time that they'd ever, in their 100-year history, hired a geologist. So you you had been at the University of Washington, which is a big school in a big city. Yes. And then um, in New York. Yes. And now you're going to Dillon, Montana. You must have <laughs> felt like you were, and, and not just Dillon, Montana, but to what was probably the very last normal school in the country and yeah. a, a normal school where the enrollment was how many students? Uh, I, there's no way we had more than 600 FT on campus uh, when I arrived. Uh, there might have been a few additional students through the early childhood program, um, but I think we were probably sitting at six or 700 max FT total for the institution. And um, yeah, the state of the state of Montana, you know, uh, had gone through uh, multiple periods of uh, looking at campus closures. And so uh, there had been numerous attempts to close uh, the Western Montana, what was called Western Montana College of the University of Montana, uh, the year I arrived, uh, there were there had been many attempts to uh, close it, um, especially, you know, actually going as far back as 1913, uh, there had been attempts to close the <laughs> campus. Um, and uh, okay, so 
you it was on the edge and i you know when i applied for the job uh, my uh, one of my advisors i remember uh, he's he's a character and and uh, he i talked to him on the phone and i asked him if he would write the letter of recommendation recommendation uh, reference letter and he said uh, I, he said you might just get that goddamn job i'm not going to write that letter <laughs> oh wow you um you were you know, you were kind of living on the edge with this. Yeah, it was, I think that, you know, I'd been sick with uh, Lyme's disease. They really were not figuring out what, what it was. I had a doc at the University Hospital in uh, Seattle actually tell me at one point that uh, I might have Lou Gehrig's disease. Uh, those kinds of things get your attention. And um, so I, uh, I think I came into it with an attitude of... Um, this was an opportunity. Uh, to me, it was kind of like Disneyland's open and nobody's there. Uh, it was an opportunity for faculty to come in and change the institution in the way that they wanted it to be, uh, not the way in which it's supposed to be. And so right from the get-go, uh, you know, the first thing I did was I started working with my colleagues to use that BLS degree that we had on the books to generate a uh, liberal arts program using the coursework for the secondary ed teachers, because we could pull together liberal arts degrees out of those courses. There was enough coursework, for example, in English to certify a person in secondary ed English uh, to also generate a liberal arts degree in literature and writing. So uh, the very first thing we did was generate, I don't know, I think we had five BLS tracks um, that we did uh, using these uh, courses that the secondary ed people took. Um, you, so you, that's kind of how we got started. And you weren't hired to do this. No. <laughs> you, you were hired to come and teach geology to those who I, were intending to be Teachers, high school. Yeah, I, I I was hired to teach earth science, physical science, and geography. <laughs> and and you and you and that was it. <laughs> so, I'm just I'm just starting to get this really wonderful image of you. That you've been in big cities, you've been in New York, um, and uh, you've gone through this personal health crisis, and and so you step out on the edge. Um, so to speak, and but as soon as you arrive, you look at your job description and say, "That's that's not why I'm here. I mean, I'm here to teach, of course, but 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 I'm here to do some transformation." Yeah, I I just thought it was an opportunity, and I that's really I cool. That I think it 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 felt that way to me because there was a small nucleus of uh, younger faculty at that time. We're, we're not so young anymore, but we were then who. Uh, you know, were keen on doing something different. I don't think that they knew what that would be. None of us knew what that would be, but uh, we knew that, you know, we wanted to do something different. And so we we started with these, uh, you know, basic liberal arts degrees. I remember we formed a committee to do it, program and arts, program, uh, past committee, program and the arts and sciences committee. That's what it was. And uh uh, we generated, um, again, four or five uh, tracks and this BLS degree, and um, state was not, you know, you have to also recognize the state wasn't allowing us to do anything. They were like, you know, you guys are teacher school, that's it. So you can't duplicate any degree that exists in the state of Montana. You, you can't have an English degree. You can't have a geology degree. You can't have a chemistry degree. So we were really hamstrung. And uh, uh, one of the things I remember, so in the very first year I was here, I went to the Board of Regents meeting. Uh, they're the governing body for the state. Um, so this state has a, um, a state Board of Regents that is appointed by the governor and run through the Montana University system in Helena. And uh, there was this regent, which are just lay people that are appointed by the governor. Yeah. And this guy was from Billings and, and he was this pint sized guy he was all hat, no body. And 
<laughs> he, he came up to me and he says, give me one good reason why that campus ought to be open down there in Dillon. Um, and I knew that, you know, that uh, the uh, LDS church had been looking at uh, turning it into BYU uh, Montana and that it had been considered for uh, conversion into the women's minimum security prison. And I couldn't come up with one <laughs> reason why it should be open other than I kind of liked the job that I'd just taken. And so I said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give it some thought. And I'll get back to you. So the next regions meeting, I came up to him and I said, all right, I, I, I now I've got an answer for you. And he said, okay. And I said, well, I said, you know, you all think that economic activity is all on the I-90 corridor, but uh, uh, it, I'm telling you that it's coming up from the south on the I-15 corridor um, from Salt Lake, Pocatello, Idaho Falls, and Boise. And uh, that uh, if you want the state to be economically successful, you do not want them to see the junkyard in Manida and then get to the ghost town of Lima, and then get to Dillon with its closed university, and then arrive at Butte uh, with its gigantic pit of, you know, contaminated water <laughs> 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 and mine dumps. Uh, and he said, okay, okay, I get it. <laughs> and so, well, that is a uh, pretty, uh, that's a pretty good way to describe it, that we want our front door to look better. Absolutely. So the and be only, better. I knew that I knew they didn't care about education. They only cared about economics. <laughs> and, uh, and so, um, you know, the, we but I knew also it was a, an epiphany for me that we had to have a reason to exist. So we could not be a normal school because you could get teacher certification at Walmart in 93. Um, and so we had to do something. And uh, the first thing we did were create these degrees. And in fact, actually, although it seems ridiculous now, we created the first environmental sciences degree, which is my department now here. Um, we created the first environmental sciences degree uh, in the state of Montana. And within two years, Missoula thought it looked good and they created their own. <laughs> and so <laughs> did they make knew... you give years back after that or did, did, did they let you keep teaching it? No, they let us stay. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> um, but because ours was called a BLS in environmental science, so oh, that's right. Uh, it it was different. We kept arguing it's different, and so uh, it it struck me right away that um, we couldn't save this campus based on what we offered. We had to do it based on how we offered it, and so. Uh, it just hit me one day. I remember that George Dennison, who was the president of the University of Montana, Missoula, and we reported to them, um, was on our campus basically to have a discussion with us about what we were going to do to save this place. And I went up to George and I said, I introduced myself and I said, George, I said, what would you say if I told you we were going to go on the block system like they use at Colorado College? And he paused and he looked at me and he said, you know, my son goes to Colorado College. And I said, no, I didn't know that. What a coincidence. And said, yes. And then he said, you know, I think that's a that's a great way to teach and learn. And then he paused again. And then he got really close to me. George was a, a very confident person. <laughs> and he got really close to me, way invading my space. And he took his right index finger and he poked me in the chest. And he said, you'll never pull it off at Western. <laughs> and he poked me three times in the chest. <laughs> and so that afternoon, I went to my colleagues and I said, we're going on to the block. <laughs> we're um, <laughs> going to make so, this work. <laughs> I was able to make a hire. Uh, uh, a colleague of mine, Sheila Roberts, who a geology professor, another geology professor, and kind of bridging the gap between chemistry and geology. You have to remember, we had, there was one geologist, one chemist, one physicist, and two biologists when I got here. That was our staffing in the sciences. Oh, period. my goodness. That is small. But, okay. then, but then you only had 600. Uh, right. But students. we were less, we had less staffing than the typical class A high school in the state of Montana. Um <laughs> 
And so we were really, you know, buying eight ball. So, you know, we, we grouped together and we formed environmental sciences, but again, that wasn't going to be enough to pull us out of the hole. And everyone really wanted us to go away. Uh, you know, I think really people wanted, you know, outside of people in the Dillon community, you know, the, the system wanted us to go away. Um, and so, uh, when we hired Sheila, Sheila got some money from uh, a research group in the state. Uh, you know, it was just the research officers. And she got some money to travel down to Colorado College. And I had a colleague down there in geology. And so I set up a visit for the provost and um, Sheila and I to go down there. And uh, our goal was to go down there and write a feasibility report on Montana Western becoming uh, a block school, the first public university in the history of the United States to go on the block. And my goal with it all was experiential learning. I wanted to turn Western into the experiential learning campus of the University of Montana. This is how I thought we were going to have a reason to exist. So that while they were lecturing over Missoula and Bozeman and Tech, um, we would be the place people would go to go out in the field and actually work on projects because you had freedom from scheduling with the block system. You, that was my only interest in it. Rob, tell us, um, not to interrupt this great story, no, but, okay. but most of our listeners probably don't know what the block schedule means. Okay. So Colorado College in 1969 invented uh they probably invented, there's some debate over whether there was a school called Hysham in the Midwest that had it for a, a variant of it in the 40s. But, um, you know, it was 1969, peace, love, and dope, and everything was possible. And an administrator went around Colorado College and said, if you could change anything about this campus, what would you do? And an English prof, I think it was, said, give me my 15 students, which was their student-faculty ratio, and, and no interruptions. And that was the birth of the block, where you take one class at a time for 18 instructional days, three and a half weeks, and uh, there everything is one credit, the typical private school system and we just converted it to four so uh as a public every class would be four credits here um taken one at a time 18 days you would take four of them per semester for 16 credits so a normal semester just broken broken down into four blocks so that are month long blocks yeah so instead of showing up at class a student thinks well at eight o'clock i've got english and then at 10 o'clock i've got math and then at yep. 11 o'clock I've got uh, geology what you've got is is that you show up and you've got uh, the student has a hundred percent focus yep, on one class correct. you finish the class and then you start the next class yeah I one uh, another another Same. epiphany that I had is I, I was teaching an intro geology class and I got done and there were four uh, students outside of the uh, classroom and I could hear them and they were one of them said, okay, now you're going to go to chemistry and you're going to go to English and you're going to go to uh, the business class. They were dividing up the responsibilities of the courses because all they had to do were take notes. They didn't really have to be there. Um, they were 50 minute classes, right? Three days a week. Yep. And all, somebody was just going to yammer on for 15 minutes. So they just had to have somebody to get the notes. And nowadays, you can buy the notes for almost every class online. Um, they're available. And they're available worldwide. You can get them in, for any university in any country. Uh, and so I just knew that we had to move this place. Our greatest weakness was our small size, and I knew that was our greatest strength because the difficulty in having freedom from scheduling and working with students experientially where they're engaging in authentic practice in the discipline is is freedom of time and and you can only get freedom of time if you have uh small numbers uh to work with if you've got to have 500 people in a lecture class you just can't do this because you can't take 500 people out onto the stream 
I'm told that yeah. I'm told that 85 percent of colleges and universities in America have in their mission statement experiential education is one of their core. Themes. Yeah, they, yeah, but, they nip around but, at the edges. <laughs> yeah, but you've taken this to a whole different degree. Yeah, this is a we. I haven't lectured. I don't lecture. Um, my classes are completely field and project based. So tell me what I would expect if I was a student in your class. So I've got an environmental field studies class I teach in the fall. And what we do is we go out and um, I get a project from one of the local agencies like Montana Fish, Wildlife and Parks. Um, and uh, so, for example, we've been working on the uh, grayling in the upper big hole. Uh, grayling are down to about a thousand fish um, due to uh, mostly habitat destruction related to bad ranching practices. So um, an agreement was struck between uh, federal and state agencies and landowners to uh, uh, allow for habitat restoration in order for grayling to have a shot at making it not be listed on the endangered species list. And uh, the work that they're doing, nobody was doing any assessment of that work other than electroshocking to see how many grayling there were uh, to see if it was working. So um, what I do is I go to the land managers and say, okay, what do you guys want? You know, what do you, what do you need done? And so uh, we went up on the, the Big Hole Valley, um, up on the Big Hole River, uh, about 40 minutes from uh, campus and I leave at 8 eight fifteen in the morning with the students and we're up there all day and they're in hip boots and waders on the river doing uh, stream cross-section profiles and assessing riparian vegetation bank stability uh, using server samplers to collect macroinvertebrates and determine what the food resources look like for grayling in the stream uh habitat surveys all of it sediment su surveys and uh and then by about week we're up there for two two and a half weeks working every day all day long i typically get them back by 3 30 so if they're a student athlete they can make practice um or if they're in a job they can make it back by that time and then uh, uh by week three we're in the uh, data analysis mode uh, they're, you know, sieving sediments and counting bugs and uh, using lab equipment to go through and do all the analyses. And then they go into report writing mode. And uh, the reports um, are professional quality assessment reports. So the one I've got sitting here in front of me is 456 pages long. And uh, we give them to the agencies uh, so that they have assessment of whether their restoration work is actually working or not. Um, so it's a real outcome that the students achieve from their work. And, wow. And, uh, and that goes for 18 days. Yes. And then on the 19th day or whatever, they, then they show up in um, an English class or something. They get a four-day break. Four-day break. So uh, they get Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, we faculty are grading like mad and getting ready for the next <laughs> block. <laughs> but they're off skiing at Maverick Mountain. Um, and so uh, it, um, yeah, we've got this, you know, you're drinking from a fire hose. But, you know, I, one of the things I always like to point out, one of my math colleagues, when we first went on to this um, in 2005, he said to me, he, he came down to my office and he looked, you know, like something that the dog had drug out from underneath the porch. And, and he looked at me and he said, I've never been so tired in my life. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I thought, oh boy, you know, this is not good. Um, you know, because I'm the great Satan of this whole thing. And, you know, that, if this is Southwest Montana. They'll lynch me, <laughs> you know, if this goes poorly. Um, and uh, he looked at me and he said, but it's a good tired. <laughs> so he said, oh, you know, he was just so excited about what he had just done in that block. And I've never seen a faculty member like that before. 
So if no grousing, no grousing, right. and no griping. What does math look like for 18 days? Oh, it's really cool. You know, they'll give these guys, uh, they give the students uh, problems set to work on in the morning. Uh, some of them are real data. They'll collect, they'll take data from us. So, for example, uh, you know, we'll partner, you know, with, it's so small that, you know, you know everybody. So somebody who's teaching probability might, you know, gather some data from project, you know, bug counts that I'm working on. Uh, you know, an environmental field studies class, and they'll take those data and they'll use those data. And many of those students took the environmental field studies class and collected, you know, some of them collected those data. And they, they'll they learn math using those data and they'll be given stuff to work on. And, and then they'll kind of be left to work on it for a while. And then they'll come back and they'll go over it um, with the professor. And so in many ways, it's it's, you know, really a great way to learn math. I, when we went down to Colorado College to check them out and write that feasibility report, um, I remember we went to the math people because I, I asked my colleague down there, set me up with the people that hate this system. <laughs> I don't want to talk to the people that like it. Set me up with the people who hate it. So he said, okay, I'll set you up with math. And I'm like, no surprise there. So uh, I go in and I, and, and I talk to this math prof and I said, so I, my my friend says, you know, you guys don't like the block. And he said, uh, who said that? And uh, he said, no, that's that's just baloney. He said, come here, follow me for a second. And I follow him. And we went out of this other room and there was a there was a one of these uh, mobile chalkboards and there was a couch. And he had a calculus class, um, and it was like a Calc 3 group, and they were working on a problem. And he said, you see this? And they were yelling and screaming at one another, all these students. And, and somebody was up at the board. And he said, I gave them a problem earlier in the day, and they've been at it, you know, all morning long like this, you know, fighting with one another over the solution to that problem. And that, you can't do that in 50 minutes. No, and can't. it was like, I thought, this is the best math teaching I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, we've just taken it maybe a step further in that we're incorporating uh, projects from all disciplines across campus, you know, into these math courses. Uh, uh, you know, we have a survey of Calc class that our students take and the faculty member teaching at Tyler Seacrest. He, he came to, you know, he comes to me and he gets things like flow meters and things like that for me. And he actually takes them out in the field and gathers data. What does a, what does a literature class look like? Um, you know, I, I think um, it's, I think the, the way to sum up you know, all of it really is, is that uh, it's authentic practice in the discipline. So writers write. <laughs> Literature people, you know, read literature and argue over the meaning of it, um, and uh, that's what's happening. So uh, they're engaged in activity and and having a longer duration of time and flexibility. It's, the key is freedom from scheduling, so that the faculty member can set up that day between eight fifteen and three fifteen, however she or he thinks. It should be set up for the best outcome, learning outcome for that topic. And so it varies by person. Um, there's a real lack of uniformity, and they're, they're, that's good. Yeah. We're trying to not be like anyone else. Um, and you, that in and class by class. Have you tried? Have, uh, have you done? Um some assessments to see how learning oh, yeah. compares some. Yeah. So I pulled some numbers up for you because I gave a talk at the national meeting of the geological society in Seattle a couple of years ago. And um, so uh, the uh, um, we did a Nessie, we did a Nessie survey, uh, uh, the uh, national survey student satisfaction survey engagement. engagement yeah yeah right engagement survey um and 
uh, the participation was high. 72% of first year students, 94% of seniors um, participated. And, and, uh, and you have to know now our, our numbers are at 1500. So uh, we went from 600 students uh, and we peaked at 1501 a couple of years ago. And we have the highest growth rate of, we had uh, anyway, a couple of years back, the highest growth rate of any campus in the University of Montana system. So students uh, like in the in the in the Montana University system and the whole system. Pardon? Students are liking this. Oh yeah. So the the Nessie survey. Um, so sixty one percent of the students reported that they were having field experiences, and eighty six percent were reporting that they were engaged in service learning. And these are the highest rates for both of those categories in the whole Montana University system. Um, retention. Our fall to spring retention uh, rate uh, is over 90%. That's really and our good. persistence rates, fall to fall, are about 90%. Those are good numbers. Very high. Those are Those numbers are... that anybody would be um, happy to have. Vassar could be so lucky. <laughs> What's your graduation right. rate? Uh, okay, so degree completion, uh, 135% uh, increase in the total degrees awarded since 2004. That was the year we were not on the block in 2004. We went on it, on it in 2005. So we had 135% increase in degree completion uh, from 2005 to, or 2004, rather pre-block to 2013 when I, uh, or 2015 rather, when I got these data. Um, and that's the highest percent increase in the Montana University system. Uh, course completion, um, first year student course completion averaged uh, uh, increase uh, or um, since 2010, which is during the period of time we've been on the block, uh, that was at um, uh, 96%. So students are completing their courses, 96%. That's really great. Are, are completing their courses. And then uh, graduation. Um, uh, we increased 25% uh, our uh, six-year graduation rates increased 25%. That was the largest increase in the MUS. Um, and our employment uh, is the highest in the MUS. 80% uh, of our graduates are employed in their field within one year of graduation. So do they still want to close this down? No. We're the... <laughs> <laughs> it sounds to me like you're uh, a leader in the state now. Yeah, I mean, it... it that's going too far. Um, <laughs> I think uh, what happened was is initially you know, I I got over exposed for this. I got I was the Carnegie Case U.S. Professor of the Year. That had never happened ever in Montana, um, and and a variety of other things. But then there was a string of um, of awards, not only for faculty but for uh, the campus itself. I mean, we were consistently ranking in, you know, these, these rankings for what they're worth, uh, you know, in the top three um, for our category, which is undergraduate, baccalaureate, public. And, uh, you know, the only list we ever ranked in before was, you know, who was going to be closed first, us or Northern uh, Montana, uh, uh, Montana State Northern up in Haver. <laughs> and so, yes, we, Definitely became the, you know, the golden haired child uh, in the system. But um, honestly, uh, I still think that, you know, um, we're, we live in a society where bigger is better. And, uh, and so the emphasis is still all about, you know, cat grizz, you know, football and <laughs> what's going on at the big campuses. And I think everyone is really happy they don't have to think about us <laughs> down here. But I don't, I don't think that they're thinking that much about us. But uh, you, you've here. at least carved out a niche that 
We did curve your, out of your nose. Your imminent demise is not imminent anymore. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We saved the campus and faculty did it. Um, we had a, uh, our provost, Carl Ulrich, uh, was with us and uh, deserves a lot of credit um, for helping shepherd the whole process through. Um, our Dean of Outreach and Research, Annalise Ripley, um, she was the one uh, that helped us to get a FIPSI grant, um, which ran a pilot because, you know, the, the story is way too long for a podcast, but we had a day called Black Tuesday when everything fell apart and we had a literal meltdown with the public on this campus uh, over block scheduling. The, the public, the community was very opposed to this. Um, and the, the regents were very opposed to it, and the commissioner's office was very opposed to it. And remember, the president in Missoula poked me in the chest and said we'd never pull it off. Right. So, so we they're were, all happy. They're all happy that you're not doing well. <laughs> I, <laughs> we were pretty dead in the water in, in the late 90s with it, and then we got a FIPSI grant, and it funded a pilot, and that pilot is really how this happened here. Um, because the pilot, we brought in 75 students and we put them through their gen eds in cohorts of 25, one class at a time. And the retention rates to the fall, from the fall to the fall, uh, uh, were like 96% in that first cohort. And the chancellor at the time, Steve Hulbert, uh, he knew that we had to do this because, you know, he had achieve the goals of the FIPSI grant. And FIPSI, Fund for the Improvement of Post-Secondary Ed, is designed for, you know, if you if you show that this unique thing that you're going to do, they only fund the most kind of radical changes. And if what you're proposing is shown to work, you had better adopt it, <laughs> or you'll probably never get another FIPSI grant again. So, um, Long story short, we adopted and uh, went on to it in 2005. And then these numbers have occurred since 2005 that, that I've been giving you. Well, that's, so, uh, that's an inspiring story. It's inspiring because, um, number one, it seems that most innovation occurs at the threat of death. That there's got to be a crisis of some type yes. in order for people to be motivated. And, I agree. and yeah, and so many schools are good, mm -hmm. but how in the world do you take good to something really special when, when most everybody's quite satisfied with good, but then, but then the other I, part of this is so amazing is that this was, this was a grassroots effort. This is the faculty, totally. a brand new faculty member that shows up and says, I know where I arrived, and I know this place is going to die, and I've staked my career on this, and let's reinvent. That's a, that's really cool. Yeah, and the willingness of other faculty to give it a shot, even those who you know did view me as the great Satan, and uh, you know thought this wouldn't work. Um, you know, I give as much credit in many ways to uh, the detractors. We learned from the detractors uh, a lot, <laughs> and uh, you know we just we tried to keep professional, <laughs> and I think it was successful because it's grassroots, came from the faculty, um, and uh, so there was buy-in at that level. You know, um, when when I went to Washington D.C. and I lobbied uh, the FIPSI grant administrator to do this, he just started laughing. And I said, what? And he said, this is the greatest idea I've ever heard. Um, it'll never happen. <laughs> and I said, why is that? And he said, well, the faculty will never do it. And I said, I have the <laughs> faculty. <laughs> and we'd done a poll. And I had we had 84% of the faculty willing to give this a shot when I went to FIPSI in 2001 or whenever that was. And... Uh, and so wow. that was key. That was key. And it was very important that we had, you know, some administrators like Carl and Annalise who were there, you know, who were, you know, could help shepherd us through the, um, 
administrative processes because we had people from the Dillon community going to the regents meetings and taking the mic, at, you know, the podium uh, at these uh, at the public uh, statement periods and just trashing us as individuals, not just the block, but, you know, me personally and some of my colleagues, you know, who are involved in this. Um, and uh, so to actually get it to happen, it did require some guts on the behalf of some administrators to stay with us. Um, the, the first chancellor that we tried to get this done under was Sheila Stearns, who I'm close friends with now. Um, she became commissioner of higher ed in, in Montana and eventually one year as the president of Missoula and then retired. And uh, I know that Sheila, Sheila left shortly after Black Tuesday when it caved the first time around. And I told her, you know, we were discussing it once and I think she was you know, expressing you know, regret that she didn't get it done. And I said, look, you could have stopped this at any time <laughs> and you didn't. So by not stopping this, she played a hugely important role in making it happen. And she had every reason to stop us because the Dillon community was uh, up in arms over this. Um, it was, you know, literally, yeah. I, I think I'm suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder <laughs> from <laughs> having gone through it. Uh, so it, it's not just, the faculty. I mean, the fact it's absolutely essential that the faculty make this happen. And I've done consulting all over the United States on block scheduling and making this transition for other publics. And uh, the first thing I tell them is that it's got to come from the faculty um, because you, you, you just can't make that horse drink from the trough. That yeah. horse has to want to drink from that trough. They had to build the trough. <laughs> Well, I, I, I just feel like the best thing to say is congratulations. This is amazing. Um, Thanks. Innovation is so hard to do, and it seems harder to do in, in universities than about anywhere because we've got this yes. tradition that just goes back <laughs> so long. Yeah. It's hard I to agree. envision a different world. I agree. And I, that was a tough thing for my colleagues when we got it. You know, there was a moment for a lot of us, I, and me too. Uh, it was like, uh-oh, <laughs> now we got to do this. <laughs> and, you know, I think geologists, you know, if I could be so bold to say it, geologists kind of get this system because we have a month-long field camp system that we go through and that we, you know, that I had taught all of my career um, for Princeton University and uh, now University of Houston. And, and so we are used to immersion scheduling in authentic practice in the discipline through the field camps. And so it's very natural to geoscientists, I think, this kind of learning. Um, maybe not so natural to, say, somebody in math or in English. But I give huge credit to my faculty colleagues because they had the guts to say, okay, I, this is, I, you know, what I know is 50 minutes of lecture three days a week. Um, and all my life, this is how I was educated. And, and uh, this is what I know. And I'm going to throw that out. And I'm going to, I'm going to experiment until I figure out what works using this system. Rob, and, oh, go, yeah, ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. No, I just think they deserve a huge amount of credit for being willing to do that. Um, and I, I have to say that I think that at a time when there's a lot of negativity in higher education and people are uninspired and they're pulling the paycheck, which is a horrific thing to happen to faculty members, um, you know, we don't do this for the money, it's a passion. And yet I see tremendous amounts of negativity out there. And, and so to me, uh, one of the most, um, one of the best things about this is that faculty were genuinely excited about using this system 
figuring out a way to use this system. Well, and, and when you and the rest of your faculty went down this path, you had to have been thinking, if this fails, we're dead. Definitely. This I mean, a, I knew that I would have to leave town because they, they would kill me. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you continued in the same strategy that you had always been done, there might be hope of pulling this out. It's certainly yes. not high risk because you you yep. had been this way for a hundred years and there had been talk yes. about closing it since uh, 1913. So yeah. the odds are okay, momentum, keep going. But once you once you stepped off the cliff and said we're going block, you you had to have in the back of your mind if this fails, the campus is going to be closed down. This is all they need for the excuse to finally lock us out. Yes, and I I think. To the credit of the folks in the community who were so, you know, cons they were so concerned that they were willing to go to a board of regents meeting and take a mic and speak against us and the and the approach, um, that they thought the same thing, <laughs> right? They yep, were thinking right. exactly the same thing. These, these knuckleheads are going to ruin this for us, and we're going to lose our gonna, community. Our, yes, they're they're going to tank this place. Yes. Absolutely. And so they deserve, I understood that. I, I, I really don't have ill will towards my, uh, you know, my uh, fellow members of the community uh, over the tough years of getting to the block. I mean, but it took us 11 years from the day that I got poked in the chest by George Dennison to the day that we um, uh, adopted uh, campus wide. It was 11 years. And you went from about 600 students to what, 16? 1,501. 1,501. All of your outcomes are up. Enrollment's yes. up. Yep. Finances are good. Yep. Nobody Stable. wants to turn back and undo this. No. No. You. The great thing, here's, here's a great story, real quick. So there was a fellow at a local restaurant uh, who was really opposed to it. <laughs> and uh, I had uh, I knew him and I had his wife in a class of mine uh, before we we're on block. And every time I go in that restaurant, he would come over to me and he would really give it to me over the block. You know, this is a bad idea. We shouldn't do this. This is a bad idea. And um, right. He goes out of business if you fail. Yes, absolutely. And he was really worried about how he was going to get workers for his business on mm -hmm. this schedule. It just people just didn't understand it. And, um, and so, uh, we were into it about five years and, uh, I was in one day and I were on, I had my whole class. I bring, I, my structural geology class is taught completely in the field and the last day is a field final. And then as they're making their maps and writing up their reports, I have them do that down at this restaurant and I buy them pizza <laughs> and, uh, this fellow, Paul came over to me and he said, I'm sure glad we went to the, we, I'm sure glad we <laughs> went awesome. <laughs> to the block system. And I thought we won the war. Yeah. We won um, the war. <laughs> we won the war because they think it's their idea. And uh, that's what we wanted, right? We wanted them to, to believe in it and, and yeah. like it and think it was their idea. That's great. And everybody's and so proud you, about it. Everybody. You couldn't find a person, I think, that thinks the block's a bad idea. Um, it is universally liked and, uh, it's now starting to catch on in Montana at other places. And, you know, I get calls from CEOs at some of the other campuses and would you come talk to our faculty about this and, and so on. And so there's some, there's some, it's starting to catch a little, uh, and there's ways to downsize it for bigger places as well. I've always, um, fantasized about um, generating a honors college. Honors colleges are wasted on students who are already going to be successful. And I, as a first generation, low income kid myself, uh, I think that honors colleges, there should be honors colleges now generated using the block system where you take high potential high risk at risk students and you put them through their gen eds one class at a time in cohorts and in experiential threaded classes where there are themes that tie the subjects together and those 
students are going to be successful at rates that nobody's ever seen before in the United States. That makes perfect sense because they come in, they're able to focus, they build a really good relationship with one faculty member. They create this cohort of friends that they see all day, every day. Yep. They, they feel a sense of belonging and, and they see that their education has um, a real purpose to it. You're, you're, out, you're out doing genuine research. They, real stuff. And there's a yep. connection between that and a job. Absolutely. These guys walk out with portfolios filled with examples of what they can do, not just a listing of classes. And that absolutely plays a role in our really high uh, job placement rates. Um, these students, all they're building the work experience while going to school that all the employers want. And so when they ask them, you know, can you operate this piece of equipment? Yes, I did that in this class, working on this project, doing this stream restoration study, et cetera. And it, it lands in jobs and uh, it gets them into grad schools. And grad advisors love these students because they're ground ready. You know, they, they know how to do projects. Well, Dr. Thomas, this has been fascinating. Congratulations. And um, thanks. thanks for spending time with us. And thanks for giving us a great example of innovation in higher education, finding you, um, challenges. And, um, you bet. It, I hope this spreads. Pleasure. Yeah, me too. Me too. It, it will only be successful if it spreads. Um, it, it can't just stay here. It, it, uh, you're right. That, that's crucial. You've been listening to Solutions for Higher Education, a podcast featuring Scott L. Wyatt, the president of Southern Utah University in Cedar City, Utah. We've enjoyed having as our guest today Dr. Rob Thomas, a professor of geology from the University of Montana Western in Dillon, Montana. We thank Rob for joining us, and we thank you, our listeners, for listening. We'll be back again soon. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to Solutions for Higher Education. To subscribe to this podcast, please visit www.suu.edu forward slash President's Podcast, where you will find both the audio and a written transcript of today's podcast. The original music for this podcast was composed by Jack Barton, a master's degree student in music technology at SUU. For more information about Southern Utah University, please visit www.suu.edu.